Um, I'm Courtney Lytle. I'm an attorney here in town. I um, teach at Emory part-time doing copyright law and other intellectual property. I have um, been doing this for ages and what we're going to do this morning is start with a little bit of an overview so we're all kind of on the same page. Because um, if I just say, okay, what questions do you have? First off, you know, that doesn't seem much like a panel. Um, and second off, let's all get on the same page of stuff I need you to know, and then you can ask me questions, and I'll make sure I leave time for it. Um, and since we're a smaller crowd today, there'll be plenty of time, yay. Okay, first thing, there are three main types of ways to protect your creative stuff. I'm assuming most of y'all are thinking about creating things or are already creating things, whether you're an artist or an author or a programmer. Um, in this room, I have to have a programmer when I'm over at the art show, not as much. Um, different crowd. So there are three main types of law that will protect your creative stuff. One we're not talking about here much at all, which is patents. Um, those are for the smart folks, and some of y'all are probably here, smarter than I am. That's the hard science stuff. That's um, pharmaceuticals, that's inventions, that's cool machines that will save the world or actually destroy it, that would count too. They're not real moralistic about what they'll cover and what they won't. So the um, patent office is a very expensive place to get access to. You need a pretty good patent lawyer if you want any hope of your patent succeeding because how it's written makes a big deal of difference. Seriously, something from the internet is not going to get you there. And, but it's very expensive, prohibitively so for individuals usually. If y'all are really rich, yeah, you can totally do it. Um, and if so, talk to me after. We can come to an arrangement. Um, but it's going to cost you tens of thousands of dollars to get a patent and tons of time. So there's your patents. We're not talking about those. Um, trademarks are something else that many of you are familiar with, but we're not talking much about today. Look, here's one, Dasani. Dasani tells me that I just paid a lot of money to get water in a bottle. Um, I could have gotten it out of the tap. But Dasani tells me where I got it from. I got it from Coca-Cola product. I know that this is just a byproduct of their process making Coke. Some, someone at Coke said, hey, you know, Epis, Epion folks are making money. We make this stuff as part of our process. If before we put the ingredients into it, we just bottled it. Hey, and it's one of their biggest sellers. Um, but Dasani tells you what, what's in the bottle. This label tells you where it's from, what the product is, but more importantly, the source of the product. I know this is from my friends at the Coca-Cola Company, who I think can hear us from here. Um, so the trademarks are there to identify the source of the product or the good. It's really for you. You wouldn't know that to talk to trademark lawyers who think it's to protect their company's name, but really trademark is all about when you buy this product, you know what you're getting. It's a Consumer Protection Act, really. So when you buy, I have a little swoosh on my feet, but they're a different swoosh than the swoosh on a Coke can. We know the difference between the swooshes. We know what that means. We know who made my shoes. Hey, look, we know who made my shoes. Um, we know who made my water. That's what trademark's all about. So if you have something that you want to use to identify your product, that's something you might trademark. It's your brand name. Also, not really what we're talking about, but there's sometimes a little bit of crossover between copyright and trademark. What we're really talking about, though, is copyrights, which is the coolest part. It's the part I like, and it's the part I do really. So that's why I'm talking about it. Funny how that works. He was going to ask me to talk about patents, but then we both laughed and moved on. Um, so copyrights are the artsy stuff. It's your books. It's your movies. It's your artwork. It's your songs. Anything that is expressed in a tangible medium is already protected by federal copyright. Now here's one of those things that, although most of you were not alive when the previous Copyright Act was in place, many of you still have ideas from it. Um, that if you publish something without the little copyright notice, or if you publish something without filing copyright first, you lose your copyright. No longer true. Has not been since the 76 Act went into effect. And just to make sure we know that it's really Congress, the 1976 Act went into effect, when would you think? Yeah, January 1st, 1978. Go Congress. So the 76 Act, since then we've done away with the formalities. You no longer lose your protection if you happen to publish it without the little C at the bottom. And you don't have to file. You are automatically protected as soon as you fix your idea in a tangible medium, meaning write it down or draw it or however it's going to be preserved for the ages. It's covered once it's there. Now computers count. There was a question at one point saying, hmm, Computer memory, that's not tangible exactly because we can't see it or feel it. Um, Copyright Act has had struggles with computers since 
computers were invented because we're lawyers and we don't understand them as a general rule, especially when they were first coming out. There's some real problems in the Copyright Act of how it addresses software and how it addresses computers because they were putting the stuff in the Copyright Act before anyone really had computers, except probably the folks like you. The hardcore computer folks were using them, the rest of us vaguely knew they existed, but this was in the days of the punch cards. That's when they started putting it into the Copyright Act. Not as neat a combination as you might think. Lawyers are usually behind the curve on tech. There are exceptions, and some of them lecture here for other classes, um, other panels, sorry, not classes. Guess what I do for a living. Um, but you'll have some of the high tech guys here as well. Lawyers as a whole aren't very good at that. So whenever you're gonna see laws trying to adapt to high tech moves, we're usually at least six or seven steps behind. Yeah, that's what we do, we're happy that way. So you've gotta fix it in a tangible medium. The main thing that means is while it's an idea in your head, it is not protected yet. I mean, it's protected by your skull, but by nothing else. Once you fix it in tangible medium, you have a federal copyright. Congratulations, any of you who have ever written something down have a federal copyright. Let's see, in the art panel room, they give me paper and I draw crap on it really badly because it's the art show, so I love doing bad art. It's the only kind I can do, but I think I shouldn't draw on the screen. But if I drew a very poorly executed horse on a piece of paper in here, I would have the copyright in that drawing just by virtue of drawing it. Now, what I'm saying, not so much. I've got my notes. You'll notice my notes are somewhat shorter than my delivery, so I don't have my entire speech re written here, but they're recording me, so hey, look. Now, am I a little bit nervous staring at the camera? Hello. Um, I'm being fixed in a tangible medium. Woohoo! The, there's a copyright in this presentation. Federal copyright by virtue of me being nervous at the camera. If you really care about the thing you're creating, so not the crappy horse that I would sketch on the sketch pad up here, but you know the novel you're writing, the painting you have done, something that you actually care about, you still need to file. You can't sue really to protect it, the damages you get are different, there's a whole bunch of things that happen when you file it, not the least of which is that you can actually prove that you created it and that you have filed it with the Library of Congress. So when you get to the point that you have a work you actually care about, it's already protected, but let's go ahead and file, because then you're protected better. And I like better. So, something you care about, go ahead and file. You don't technically have to. You don't have to put the little C with a circle on it. But if you're putting artwork up on the web, or your story up, or anywhere that people can get at it, okay, what's the first thing that's gonna happen when you put it up on the web? Go on, you know what happens step on the web. People huh? copy it or People something. copy it. It's going to get swiped. Someone's going to use it. I mean, you're putting it up there for people to see, but when you people see it, they say, hey, I like that. Noink. If you put the little copyright notice on it, and there were official ways you had to do it under the, 70, under the 09 Act, but the previous 09, not 2009, the one before that. Um, under the old Act, there were specific ways you had to do it. Now it really is more, I, I kind of put it like locking the car door. It keeps honest people honest. There are lots of people who believe if I see it on the internet and it doesn't have a copyright mark on it, it means I can use it freely. That's not true, but they think it is. So there are some honest people who wouldn't steal your stuff if they knew they weren't supposed to. Put a little C on there as a note for the dumb people, hey, don't steal this. Okay, some people still will, but it at least is a note to the world, I would like you not to steal this. Now, we're gonna, talk a little bit about what is and is not covered by copyright. There are pretty much anything you can express creatively is going to count. It's meant to be the artsy one. But a couple things are not, like facts. If you have a book that you are writing about, oh gosh, we found where Elvis is actually living right now. Not in a tomb in, in um, Graceland, he's actually in a small town in the south of France. And I can prove it, I've got the pictures, I've got the facts, I've dug up archives, I know where Elvis really is. Elvis was a singer. He was fairly famous. <laughs> um, I'm looking around and saying, oh, some of you don't even know who this is, okay. Um, he died, people thought he wasn't dead because, okay. Just work along with me. He's last generation's Tupac. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, he sound, see, to me, that sounds like a Vulcan, isn't and he, then it would be okay, but it wouldn't sound good. Isn't he hanging out drinking with Jim Morrison, Jimi Hendrix, and Janis Joplin? Well, yeah, that's the whole point of the book. <laughs> They're all there having a party in the south of France, and I can prove it with my book. So I've written all of these incredibly cool things in my book. 
And someone says, hey, that's pretty cool, but man, she can't write for crap. I'm going to get better pictures because I know where they are now. I'm going to go with a good camera as opposed to, she kept forgetting her phone. She drew sketches. I don't know what's wrong with her. Um, and so they're going to actually get good pictures of all those cool folks hanging out drinking in the south of France. And they're going to write a book based on the facts that I knew. I'm the one who discovered it. You know what? They can do it. What they can't do is use my pictures or my sketches if I continue to forget my phone so I couldn't take pictures of them in the bar. Um, but they can use the facts, even though I spent years and lots of grants from the federal government, lots of taxpayer money went into me hanging out in South of France, hanging out in wine bars till I met Elvis. Um, they can still, in spite of all that effort I put into it, they can just take all those facts out of my book and write a better book. Totally legal under the copyright law. Now, if they're scholars, they're supposed to cite my work. Because if they don't, that's plagiarism. Plagiarism and copyright really don't have any connection, although people confuse them. Plagiarism is what you have to do so when you publish your scholarly work, people aren't thinking that you, that you did steal the ideas or the facts. When you're an academic, you're supposed to cite your sources. That's what plagiarism is if you fail to cite your sources. Copyright is if you copy stuff you're not allowed to. Plagiarism gets you in trouble in the academic world. Copyright gets you in trouble in the real world. Sometimes, sometimes not. Okay, so we know that our facts aren't really covered. We know that ideas aren't covered. When we get into things that are practical items, we start having a bit of a trouble too. Um, clothes are generally not covered. There's a panel on that tomorrow, so we're not going to go deeply into it. But anything that has a useful aspect to it. Here, we've got a hat up here. Hold your hat up, please, or stand up. Look, it's a hat. This covers your head. It keeps the sun off. And it's got cool colors on it. Someone made it nifty looking. Excellent. Okay, you might could get copyright protection on that kind of cool tie-dye pattern. Doesn't have to be terribly original. Just has to be created by you. So other people have done tie-dye before. Go figure. In fact, I have done tie-dye before. But if you create a lovely tie-dye tapestry, even if you create a really ugly tie-dye tapestry, it can be covered by copyright law. It doesn't have to be unique. That's a kind of patent standard. Copyright can be really mundane and stupid. I don't want to call your hat mundane and stupid. Um, I don't mean that, but tie-dye can be covered. However, that's a hat. Hats are practical. Yeah, and the ones, the baseball caps, if you wear them forwards, they do block the sun. There's that lovely internet meme with the guy with the hat on backwards, holding his hands, shading his head. It's like, gee, if only there was a way we could somehow shade your eyes with a hat. Um, any rate, the practical items can't be covered by copyright. If it were unique and novel and useful, it could be patented. Sorry, hats can't be patented, not just a tennis hat like that. But it's a cool hat. <laughs> Wear stuff into my panel at your risk, own risk. Okay, so I can't protect that. If there's a way to separate the original out of the useful, I can get a copyright on the original part. Um, costumes, you, costumes and clothes, usually not, because they're just deemed to be, well, okay, these are not particularly original. This is my lawyer costume. I was going to march in the parade, but no one would have been impressed. <laughs> but so you can, if you can separate the useful from the artsy and the creative, you can get the creative aspect of it protected. That line is a kind of smushy line. It's hard to tell exactly where the function stops and the form begins and which part, if any, is protectable. We call it um, the concept of separability. If you can separate the artsy part from the practical part, the case that all of us read in law school is, a, and I don't have the pictures to put up, but it's a lovely lamp, let me tell you. It's a Balinese dancer. So it's this belly dancing statue with a lamp. Um, and every copyright lawyer in the world knows the Balinese sculpture because that was the idea of physical separability. I can see the statue, I can see the lamp. I get that. Lamp, no. Statue, yes. Copyright decision, yay. When it gets fuzzier than Balinese sculpture with lamp, then it's harder to tell which part's going to be protected. But the concept, at least, is useful item, no. Creative item, yes. The other part of what's protected that gets a little confusing is, remember I told you that that idea you have in your head is protected only by your skull? Well, where does your idea, the idea underlying your work end and your expression begin? Well, sometimes it's obvious. If I have created, oh, hypothetically, a world in which there are young English students in boarding school learning, oh, I don't know, wizarding arts, 
and there's a bad guy who keeps coming back, which they do. And I go and I create food, I create a whole little subculture world. Somewhere I have created something textured and detailed enough that I own that, if only. Um, but I own that. Now, if you're my mother and you have been exposed to exactly two pieces of science fiction and fantasy in your life, one of them was Star Wars and one of them was Harry Potter, when you read Harry Potter, you say, this is stupid, it's a knockoff of Star Wars. What? I'm like, Mom, seriously? She was at, stuck at my house very sick at Christmas. I'm like, okay, I don't know what pain meds they're giving you, but you gotta stop taking them, because seriously? She's like, well, look, it's this boy whose parents are dead, who doesn't know he's powerful, who turns out to be the one who can fight the bad guy. The bad guy wears black. I'm like, okay, the bad guy wears black, come on. And, I mean, the bad guy's name is even the same, His but it starts with a V. And then you, the more you think about it, you think, oh, shit. <laughs> but, as all of you know, and she did not, that's also the plot of, you know, half of the fantasy and science fiction novels out there. Boy doesn't know his own power, discovers he's a force for good and evil. You know, suddenly is the most powerful guy around, later discovers his parenthood, you know, all those great things. Let's be real. We all know those. Those are the standard tropes in our industry, in our genres. My mom has been exposed to two, so it's the same thing. This one's a knockoff. Like I said, even George Lucas didn't try to sue J.K. Rowling, but there are similarities there. Well, the similarities are you know, kind of like saying that every romance novel is a knockoff on Shakespeare. Boy meets girl, problems arise, things go badly. Happy ending, sad ending, that's your kind of choice at the end. You have now described every romance novel ever, including that particular play, um, which has been made into movies for those of you who don't read. So it's, but at some point, Romeo and Juliet obviously would become detailed enough to be protectable. He's been dead a long time, it's not protected anymore. But if you write a boy meets girl, things go badly story, even if Shakespeare still had a copyright, as long as you weren't talking about the Montagues and the Capulets and doing it in Italy and having people biting their thumbs and friars and poison, you know, you're okay. You can write a story about young wizards, well, you could have before it was done already, about young wizards in England going to boarding school and discovering their magical heritage and battling the bad guy whose name starts with a V without running afoul of George Lucas because there's so many differences in the texture and the details. What you have taken is just stuff that's standard plot, standard ideas, but somewhere my expression of that standard idea becomes mine. Where that line is, it gets a little squeaky in some of the narrow cases. What that means is if you're writing novels and you want to be able to control your characters and not have people able to just come and use them, make them more textured, make them more original. To the extent you use stock characters and just stock boring plots, you're not protected. You gotta go a little further, not because you have to be particularly creative or talented to get a copyright, but because if all you're doing is stuff that's been done before, you won't even meet that originality standard. It'll be stuff that's already in the public domain. Because if it's already in the public domain, nothing will pull it back out. So if I wrote a story and I done it, and I said, okay, it's in the public domain, anyone could use it, but no one could use it and then copyright it for themselves, even if they changed it. Once it's out, once it belongs in the public domain, meaning not protected, free for everyone to use and or steal, but in that case it's using because no one owns it. You can't pull it back out. So the Romeo and Juliet storyline, it's in the public domain. You can use it freely. You probably can't use the songs from West Side Story. Those are still protected. But you can use the plot line from Shakespeare. So if you look at West Side Story, I'm saying, hmm, looks a little familiar, warring sides. I don't remember Shakespeare having lots of snapping and clapping and knife fights, but you know, it's okay. There are differences. So you can't use West Side Story, but you can use the underlying boy meets girl warring families plot line because it's already out there. Does that make sense? Okay. We're also going to talk about fair use. And I'm in the minority here. Oh, Scott's still watching me. I'm in the minority here because what I'm going to tell you is not what Lawrence Lessig would tell you. Seriously, make up your own stuff. Don't try to use someone else's stuff. If you want to do fan fiction, that's tomorrow's panel too, you know, show it to your friends and that's fine. If you're trying to make a living at this, don't rely on fair use as your protection. 
Let me tell you a little bit what fair use is. I mean, it's a neat thing, and the idea of being able to expand creativity and expand expression and work on what other people have created makes a ton of sense. However, if you're going to risk your cool work on the idea that I can make money selling my story about Kirk and Spock, here's the problem. What fair use is is a defense to infringement, meaning in order for fair use to have occurred, first there was infringement and then they decide your infringement was okay. But the way you know it's infringement is that someone who owns the original content is going to sue you. And when you get sued, you need people like me, although not me, I'm not a litigator, I'm a corporate chick. Um, you need a litigator to help you get to the point that you can convince the judge that your use was indeed allowed and was a fair use. We cost a lot of money. Now, if you want to make this a philosophical battle and you want to prove that your use is good, great, find a lawyer, fight the good fight. But on a pragmatic level, if you're trying to break into an industry, if you're trying to become a writer or an artist or something to that effect, make up your own stuff so that you don't have to worry about, well, gosh, I was gonna show this in the art show or I was gonna publish this and try to sell it on Amazon as a self-published book and I just got this cease and desist letter from Paramount or it, you know, uh, whoever I'm going to get the cease and desist letter from, you know what, they've got a lot of lawyers on hand. When you get the cease and desist letter, it means you're about to be in trouble if you don't cut it out. Well, now what are you going to do with that novel you spent so much time on? If you're already famous and you already have the in-house lawyers, go nuts, do what you want to do. But most of the folks I talk to here are trying to become that. And it's just, in my mind, not worth it to risk all that cool creative effort you put into something, but you started with someone else's stuff. Make up your own stuff. That's the safer, more pragmatic way to get good at what you do. If you just love a particular fandom, gee, no one here feels that way, um, go ahead, do your fan fiction, make your costumes and stuff, but you're not going to get away with making money on it. The Carpet Ninja folks who are running around here, um, I actually have my copyright class writing about them, um, and that's why I was bemoaning my lack of phone, because I kept seeing them saying, oh, I could take these pictures to show my class if only I had my phone. Um, you can download them. I've done a couple of those already for them, but I wanted to look, I really met these guys, they do exist. And then they'll go, wow, you're an even huger dork than we thought, so maybe it's just as well. Um, but they were doing that, for those of you who don't know, I call them the carpet ninjas, they've expanded, there are geishas and there's jeeps and all kinds of stuff now. It's the guys who loved the Marriott carpet so much, y'all remember that very interesting <laughs> carpet they used to have, that they managed to get the, the pattern into fabric. Which, yeah, they were yeah. just in the parade. They were just in the parade. I've I seen them on the way over here. That's the guys I want to take a picture of. Look, I've got the Jeep! And I'm going to just remember what it looks like because I can get a close-up picture and show them from my phone and get geek cred, I guess. But they they got the cease and desist letter from the carpet company because, remember, um, practical things like carpet aren't protected, but the design on it may be. This design is covered by copyright. One wonders why it would be, but it is. The Marriott carpet that was more distinct and at least more colorful um, was also that pattern was protected by copyright owned by the carpet company. Now, when they were just dressing up and running around, that was fine. When they started selling them, then the carpet company sent the cease and desist letter. Once they said, oh, well, we'll stop selling it then. We'll just give it away. Everyone was fine again. Now, that's not really the line. Let me explain fair, when we're talking about fair use, whether it's commercial or not doesn't, is part of the calculation of whether it's an allowed use, but it's not the determining factor. However, if you're the carpet company or if you're Paramount Studios or if you're J.K. Rowling, for the most part, when you're doing it for fun, they don't care. When you start making money on it, suddenly they're interested. You are violating their trademark, or their, not their trademark, their copyright, when you were creating the fan fiction or when you made the carpet ninja outfit. You are violating their copyright, but they didn't care because there was no money involved. And if they're smart, which most of the studios and content owners are becoming, except for the ones that are becoming evil, um, they realize that if you're writing stories about their characters between movies coming out, you're keeping yourself excited, you're gonna go to the next movie. And you can dress up like Kirk and Spock here, you're happy, you're a big fan, you're keeping the fandom and the excitement alive, so the next movie they put out, no matter how bad it is, you're gonna go. They've, most of them have figured out that's smart and they'll let you do it. Once you start selling it though, they're like, wait a minute, that's money, that's ours. You don't get to do that. And that's where they start to usually care. 
That's not, however, where their rights start, okay? Let me look at my notes real quick to see what else I'm, I really wanted to talk to you about. Can um, I touch on that for, or ask a question about that real quick, or do you want to save for Q&A? We're, we're, I, want, I just want to look and see if there's any major topic I forgot to mention. Let me work, run you through a little bit about fair use, because that's always a topic people want to talk about. Um, there are legal standards. There's a, the statute gives us the four elements that we're supposed to weigh to decide whether a use is fair. Remember, to back up to make sure we're all on the same page, um, fair use is where I am going to infringe someone's copyright. I'm going to write that story about Kirk and Spock. I'm going to take that carpet and make it, in, and not just you, not just repurpose the carpet itself, but I'm going to use that pattern in my own clothes. If I picked this carpet up, well, okay, the Hilton would be pissed at me. But if I were to cut up pieces of this carpet, I can do that because we have the first sale doctrine. Um, someone has a book. No one ever has books anymore. Does someone have a book? I need to wave a book around to my hands. Just a book, any book. I got a book cover. Uh, no, I need a book. I should bring my own props. Okay, this is this is perfect. Thank you. Okay, someone sold me. Oh, that's even better. Okay. I bet she bought this book. And you know what she just did? She gave it to me. So you know what this is? This is my book. Ha! <laughs> Didn't see that one coming, did you? This is now my book. I have the right to do a lot of things with this book because I own this copy of the book. Okay, she thinks she still owns it. We can discuss whether she loaned it to me or gave it to me or sold it to me. But she bought this book, we'll assume. I'm not going to ask Actually, if you stole it. Mom gave me that. <laughs> well, we're going to assume your mom bought the book as opposed to stole it, but regardless, someone purchased this book and it's now been handed down at least three times and now I own it. What I do not own is the copyright to what's written in here. I think that's like not dirty pictures, no, just words. Okay, what I, own, what I do not own is any rights to copy these words or this art, but if I wanted to, I could rip this book in half. I'm not. <laughs> I could rip this book in half. I could burn it. I could shred it. I could throw it really hard against the wall. Now, this being me, if I threw it really hard against the wall, it would hit something but not the wall. So y'all would need to look out. Um, but I can do anything to this tangible copy that I want to. So if I wanted to tear the carpet up and pull a Scarlett O'Hara and make my beautiful gown out of carpet rather than drapes, but you know the idea, that's fine. What I can't use is the intangible property of the book, the writing in here, this story, and this picture. So I can use this tangible copy. So the Carpet Ninja guys, if they wanted to rip up the carpet and make clothes out of it, that's fine. But they took the, they copied it. That's one of the rights that you get as a copyright owner is the right to reproduce. That's why we call it the copy right. Other rights are embedded in there, the right to distribute, the right to perform, things like that. Mainly we talk about copying. So when we're talking about fair use, the first thing I did was infringe something. I was, I took a picture of the carpet and I sent it off to someone who will turn that into fabric. I assume that's how they did it. And I have infringed the copyright of that carpet. And then I did something else really cool with it. I made uniforms out of it and I laid on the ground. I'm, I hope they didn't get stepped on because they really did blend in pretty well when the carpet was still there. They were crawling along on the carpet. Did y'all see them when the carpet was still there? It was kind of cool. And when they were laying on it, it really was kind of hard to see them. I think they learned and started having handlers say, wait, don't step on the ninjas. Which would make a neat t-shirt. So first you have infringement, then you have to look at fair use. So when you have, the, you have four different criteria that you weigh to decide if it's fair use. The first one is the purpose, the character of the use. This is where we start talking about is it commercial or not. Their initial purpose of the use was to make cool costumes because that was such a cool idea and that was such a distinctive carpet. Um, we were all aware of the carpet. So the purpose of the use was not commercial. If it is transformative, that makes it more likely to be a fair use. If it's commercial, it makes it less likely. Well, they transformed it. They took carpet and made costume. Cool. So maybe we're okay. The next one is the nature of the underlying work, the nature of the work that you're swiping from. Is it something that's strongly protected or only sort of protected? If it's a phone book or if it's factual or if it's something that was barely original enough to be copyrighted, that works in the favor of the fair use. If it's something like a novel or a painting that's right in the heart of fair use, then you're going to have less likely to find the fair use. Your third element is the amount or the substantiality of the amount taken, meaning how much of it did I take or how much did I use? Did you see the photograph or did you see the portrait in the background of my video for a moment? Or was it in a um, 
scene that played for a really long time? Was it a glimpse or was it really a big part of the scene? Um, in this case, oh, uh, books are another one. One that we're going to talk about substantiality of it. Gerald Ford wrote his memoirs. That was the president after Nixon. Nixon was the one who had to resign for doing much less than our current presidents do, but that's okay. Standards change. Um, Nixon resigned. Ford pardoned him. Ford became president. People didn't like that. Um, but Ford pardoned Nixon. Ford was actually a neat guy. And in spite of tripping coming off of Air Force One twice on camera, he was very athletic. Um, and was actually a fairly good politician, the kind we don't have any of today. But he fell on his sword to pardon Nixon so they could put the whole thing behind us and move forward. That's a different panel also, but he wrote a really big memoir. And the only thing people really cared about was the little Nixon part. Someone got into his publisher's office before the book was released and said, we're just going to yoink this five pages from his big book. Well, if you're looking at the fair use thing, we talked about the amount used. Well, it was a teeny piece of a big book, but, it, but his big book wasn't out yet. They, and they got the part that everyone wanted. They got the good part. And he won against those people who published it, because although you're allowed to publish for criticism, you're allowed to publish for comment, you're not allowed to publish for, ha ha, beat you to it. Look, here's the good stuff you're waiting for from his book. And that's exactly what they did. So although they only used a little bit, they got the heart of the book. And that was not considered a fair use. That was considered an infringement. Because even though they took a teeny bit, it was the good stuff. And then the last part is the effect on the potential market. Which means, is it going to actually cost the author any money? Is it going to affect it? Are you taking his stuff and making another book? Have you copied my brilliant book about Elvis and copied it? Are you going to cost me money? Have you taken something protected and it's going to cost me in, in the market of my works? Those four things, no one of them is actually determinative. You put all of them together and you try to figure it out. The commercial, non-commercial use is usually a big one, but I want to make sure you know that is not the only factor. It is still possible to find infringement and not a fair use even if you're not selling the stuff. So if you think that since I'm not selling it, I'm safe, that's not actually true. Might be, but don't rely on that. Okay? Now, there, but to rely on fair use, again, I'm not a litigator, so I don't like just taking my chances at court. So other people will say, no, let's win, that's a great use, you should be able to do it. Again, I don't want to go through the expense and time of a trial. There are several uses that they say are always okay. You don't have to go through the four prongs if you use one of the accepted uses. Comment, parody, um, criticism, and instructional use in a classroom. Well, including, and it says this in the statute in parens, including multiple copies for classroom use. Clear enough, right? This is a fair use and is not infringement for instruction in a classroom. So there was this case where a professor made a little pack of little samples from other articles and from big books. He didn't want his class to have to buy six books, so he took little pieces from each book and used them in instruction, for instruction in classroom. And it was infringement. It says multiple copies for classroom use and instruction. This is a professor. He wasn't making money on it. But they were made at, well, Kinko's is gone now. Um, but the copy center made the copies. And the court, I kid you not, said, well, if the professor had Xeroxed it himself, it would have been OK. But because it was done at a copy shop, which was not charging more than you know the cost of the paper pretty much for these things. It wasn't a um, commercial thing, it was in the school. Um, that was not considered a fair use. And everyone said, uh, instructional use in a classroom? It was, it wasn't pushing and saying, oh, it was instructional. No, it was an honest -to -God classroom. And that was not fair use. Research is another category that's supposed to be fine. At Texaco, there were some scientists who copied a couple articles out of magazines. The, um, they were on a rotation through the office. It was an article they needed for their research. They made a copy of the article to keep in their research file because they were working on whatever the article was about, something smart involving geology, I'm sure. Um, that, in spite of saying research and scholarship in the statute, was also not a fair use. Um, on the other hand, you can find examples of cases that really should not have been a fair use that were. So it's hard to predict. There's a lovely article written by a very intelligent judge 25 years ago now, talking about, you know, fair use law is a real big mess now. There's very little predictability, and it's horrible because the thing we love as lawyers is predictability. 
we're boring by nature, I'm sorry, but we like the law to be predictable. We like to be able to tell our clients, if you do this, you're in trouble. If you do this instead, you're not. Our clients like that too. Our clients like to say, eh, I don't know, roll the dice. They like us to say yes and no. When the law is really smushy, we can't say yes and no. And we hate that. We like to say no best, but we can say both with some respectability. When the law is not predictable, we can't do that. So the judge was writing this long, very intelligent article, better than anything I've written, about how stupid it is that we can't predict it. He's like, but don't worry, it's gonna get so much better because the judges are starting to come together and it's gonna be much more predictable any minute now. It has spiraled so far out of control since that was written 25 years ago, it's not even funny. So it's an unpredictable area of law, it's expanding in some areas, things that should have been infringement by a strict reading aren't anymore, but things that shouldn't have been have been recently. So you gotta be careful with it. Okay, that was fair use. We talked about first sale doctrine. Um, okay, you had a question that you wanted to go into with something I was saying. Right, um, well, in, in this. It's about time to do it. That's their really cool giant cube microphone. Can people really not hear this voice in here? <laughs> <laughs> They're recording. They tell oh, me it's recording. Okay. Um, Otherwise, when someone watches this later, they're going to hear, and then oh, my answer, and they'll go, what the hell is she talking about now? Oh, they'll hear it. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, especially in this group, you're going to find lots of people that do three things, all with copyright and copywritten material. Mm -hmm. So your average Superman out here, or Spider-Man. Oh, yeah. The, and, and my own family is part of this, which is why I'm asking. Um, so they find themselves in three situations. Um, I'm going to go to a hospital dressed as Superman to visit sick kids for charity. Cool. Um, I'm going to stand out on a street corner with other buskers <coughs> and take pictures with tourists and they can tip me. And they're charging, they can tip if they want. And then third is your random birthday party where they pay you a hundred bucks to show up as Superman. So sometimes we hear, you know, horror stories of people that have gotten the axe dropped on them. Mm -hmm. And then we see people that are going to say, uh, you know, the new Transformers movie dressed as Optimus Prime and, you know, hanging out in the movie theater taking photos getting paid, getting tips, it's kind of all of them except charity, and nobody says a thing. So, any comment on where that kind of thing falls in? Because this crowd could oh, yeah. probably use that advice. Oh yeah, um, in fact, yesterday I was, I was tempted to wear it this morning, um, but I didn't because I didn't look real credible. My son is 12. And I went to his school Halloween party last year, and after having made lots of pumpkin-shaped uh, marshmallow treats, they were orange, it was lovely. Um, but the kids loved them. Um, I thought, oh, crap, am I supposed to wear a costume to this thing? I'm the most boring mom ever. I don't have a costume. I'm like, oh my god, who am I? Who have I become? And I was like, well, I've got this hoodie with little ears. It's a My Little Pony hoodie, which I bought as a joke, because it's adorable. I like it. Um, I'm a horse person. If there had been My Little Ponies when I was little, I would have had all of them. So a little part of me is still drawn to it. And so I'll just throw the hoodie on and say it's a costume. And I'm thinking, God, I'm so lame. Well, what I did not expect was that my son was horrified. Bonus. My poor little 12-year-old child was traumatized by the fact that his mom showed up in a yellow hoodie with ears and a mane. And I'm like, oh, I had no idea it would impact you this way. In the past, he hasn't cared. Suddenly, he's self-aware. This is fun now. Um, so la he's with us um, last night and today. And so, you know, if you go to Amazon without spending too much money, you can get some little ears and little pink inserts for your hair. And, you know, a little yellow tunic and tights and little furry leg warmers and little pink um, slippers and a tail to pin on the back. You can humiliate the crap out of your 12-year-old. It's great. We walked around last night. I kept trying to grab onto him. He's like, ah! running away. It was fabulous. It was the most fun I've had at Dragon Con Sober. And it was so fun because he was horrified. Well, now here I am. I'm supposed to be Fluttershy. I did not actually tattoo butterflies on my butt. But the idea was there. Several little girls in the food court knew who I was and squealed. Um, a couple older girls knew who I was and squealed. It was great. Everyone else said, chicken bright yellow. Okay, whatever. It's Dragon Con. Um, but my son was horrified, so my purpose was, was accomplished. I was thinking of wearing that here to say, well, what do you think? Can I wear this? And y'all would say, well, you can, but you probably shouldn't. Um, but that would just be a fashion commentary. But 
I didn't look as much like a lawyer, so I put my lawyer costume on to come in. But, so here I have ears and things, none of them are licensed, none of them are official My Little Pony things. Well, was I allowed to do that? Yeah, partially because no one cares. If you're wearing it here, if, well, first of all, if you bought a licensed Superman costume, you're good for non-commercial activities. If you are wearing it, having your picture taken and people tip you, well, now you're in the commercial use. If it's a licensed costume, you're allowed to wear it. You're not violating their copyright, but this is getting into trademarks because right. you're talking about trademarked characters. And, the, and when we get into that, it's a different analysis, and it's more about dilution of the mark and whether people are going to think you're authorized, but authorized, good, authorized by Marvel, and if you are, it's a problem, and if it starts to make their Superman character and their Superman trademark, character's copyright, trademark is the character himself that they've registered as a trademarked um, item of their army. If you're making their trademark less valuable, they can stop you from doing it. The characters, though, kind of do bleed into trademark. And for the most part, again, it's kind of like the carpet guys. They were infringing from the beginning, but the carpet company didn't care until they started charging money for it. Um, J.K. Rowling has, ha has let kids all across the world put up their fan sites and write the fan fiction, and she didn't care, and Scholastic didn't care. They got the fact that the more excited school kids there are, the more books that are going to be sold. They're smart enough to understand that. Then some kid put up his um, Harry Potter universe encyclopedia. It was well done. It was accurate. It was an encyclopedia that he put up on his fan site. Boom, down came the lawyers. Because one day, they probably want to publish a Harry Potter encyclopedia. So it's not so much what you're allowed to do without running afoul of the law, it's what the content owners put up with until they get pissed. And as soon as you start making money, they start getting more concerned. If you're walking around here looking like Superman, they're happy, because that means you'll likely go to whatever next um, superhero spinoff they do. Anyone actually see Batman versus Superman? Yeah, okay. Was it as bad as it looked like it was going to be, or was it good? No, it was bad. Okay, I thought so. But you know what? Y'all went, didn't you? And if you were walking around here dressed like either Batman or Superman, the likelihood of you going to that movie was higher. They know that. And so they don't care if you walk around here dressed like that. If you're um, taking your kids trick-or-treating dressed like that, they're good with it. If you're standing on the street corner getting your picture made, you're starting to push it because you're starting to get tipped. Um, and they start to maybe care how you're doing it. If you're going to the hospital, oh, well, that's actually good for the mark. They'll let you keep doing it. If you're doing it as birthday party stuff, they want you to license it a little more efficiently from them, and they want some more control. Um, the 501st, any members in here of the 501st? I mean, you're not in your Stormtrooper uniforms, but I realize you can take them off. You don't usually, but you can. Um, Lucas licenses that and allows it, but there are rules they have to follow about what they're allowed to do while they're in their Stormtrooper suits. One assumes the licenses don't apply to what they do when they're not their Stormtrooper suits. But they can't do anything commercial. Lucas has basically set the rules, now it's Disney, but Lucas set the rules for all those guys, saying here are the things you can do. And you can march in the parade, you can walk around Dragon Con, you can do all kinds of stuff, but you can't hire yourself out. You can't hire yourself out specifically as security guards. We tried to hire them to do that once, we thought it'd be funny. But no, they are not allowed to by the terms of their license. So they have that actually set out clearly by the great god of Star Wars. Most times you don't get that kind of clear line. The further you get towards commercial, and again, we're talking trademark in, the, in that case for the most part, rather than copyright, the further you get towards doing something that either they think they should make the money from or that's going to make them look bad, that's when you're going to start getting in trouble. So like if you were commit a felony, say, wearing your Superman costume. If they can haul you out of jail long enough to sue you for infringement, they will. <laughs> so all these companies yeah. that do, that rent out, you know, superhero characters, you know, is there, um, do they have to license that? Usually, yes. Um, sometimes they've, un you know, is it, is it theft if no one catches you? You know, if a tree falls in the wilderness. If you are using someone else's intellectual property for a commercial purpose, you're running afoul of the law, do they care? Maybe, maybe not. Do they know you're doing it? Maybe, maybe not. There was a suit that was um, that cost everyone a lot of money. Um, some guy back when 
Barney may still be popular. The purple dinosaur kids things. My child was not allowed to watch Barney because then I would have had to watch Barney. So he did not know Barney existed. <laughs> I was good with the Wiggles. I was okay with Mickey Mouse. But yeah, Barney did not play. Teletubbies. That was just weird. But it's okay. Um, but no Barney. But some guy made a purple dinosaur costume that was not a Barney costume, but was a purple dinosaur and was going to kids' parties singing insipid little songs. And he got smacked down and he lost the suit because he was clearly trying to be a character owned by people with lawyers. And they made him stop because the court said, no, that's clearly an infringement. You can't do it. They own that character. You can't be that character. So it really depends on the impact you're making. I wish I could give you a bright line test. I really, really do. Oh, no. I've I don't never know asked a lawyer to give me a straight answer. <laughs> <laughs> but there, the problem is in this area, there really isn't one. Because oh, from, the, from a purely legal standpoint, you are infringing both trademark and copyright at that point. Well, is your copyright a fair use? Is your trademark a fair use? And even though they're the same words, they're different legal standards. We just do that to keep our students busy. But the um, standards are slightly different. But a lot of times it comes down to how much does the content owner care? Do they know you're doing it? Do they care that you're doing it? I mean, obviously, we, talk, we hear about in the music industry, the school kid, the college kids who were slapped with huge lawsuits because they were using a server that had stolen music stolen music on it back in the Napster days. You know, so they smacked a couple school kids with huge lawsuits, even though everyone else was doing the same thing and these kids weren't profiting from or anything else. They were trying to make a test case and they were trying to make an example out of these poor kids. Well, they made an example. Some of them are famous now amongst certain circles for being those kids who were sued. But when the, when the content owner chooses to make your life miserable is when you'll know about it. If you're doing something like going to the hospital and stuff, I can't imagine they would care. And usually, the first thing that happens is the cease and desist letter. When you get that, stop. Hmm. Write them back and say, oh, I'm so sorry, and stop, and do something else. But you know, you, it's kind of like let the dog bite once. I would say keep doing it until you get the letter saying, quit doing that. Now, if you've been making money, they may say quit doing it and cough up your profits. But if you've just been going to do it because you're a good guy, then they'll say, okay, quit doing that. You're being good. We don't like that. We're going to punish you. But at the cease and desist letter, honestly, you're safe just to say, ever so sorry, and back off and quit. That's kind of my idea of pushing the envelope in these kinds of questions. Does that make sense? It does. Does that at least sort of answer your question in a wishy-washy, unhelpful way? When, when my son does birthday parties for an entertainment group in town, mm -hmm. he doesn't get you know, they don't put the name of the costume character who shows up at it. They just write it as costume character. You know, that's the way his invoice comes back. And they're doing that on purpose. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> the, oh, the, absolutely. You know, paper trail? What paper trail? But so. it's, uh, I mean, there are so many places. I, I could open up, well, if they publish Yellow Books anymore, I could go to the Yellow Books website right now and find a hundred different places where I could hire any costume yeah. character I and want. And for the most part, they're fine with that. Um, they hope that you've bought the licensed costume the first time. So they made their money and then they're letting you use that costume. If you were doing it in a movie, they'd stop you. If you're doing it at a birthday party, they could stop you, but they don't usually. I mean, what you're doing is technically probably not allowed, but. Free marketing. Oh, but that doesn't, copyright and trademark are both exceptions to a free market. No, I'm saying free marketing. You're going out and marketing A lot of times character. they see it that way. I mean, there are, I mean, Bain Publishing puts out some of their books free online. You can download the entire book and read it for free because they believe that that makes people buy more books. There are, honest to God, successful authors, not just wannabe authors, who do that. And they make money. So there are people who say, the more stuff of mine you get out there, the better I am. And that's why they don't usually go after the people at the birthday companies because if I have six new kids getting excited because they saw Superman at the birthday party, maybe they'll buy a comic book or, you know, and we all know that's what fandom does. They've, the content owners have gotten much better at allowing that kind of thing. They got a little squirrely when the internet exist, suddenly existed and instead of me showing my fan fiction to, my, you know, to both of my friends, I could put it up and everyone could see it in the world if they wanted to. They probably did. A friend and I actually wrote a Star Trek script in high school. It was extraordinarily bad. It was meant to be a parody, which would be a fair use, perhaps, um, and it was. And you could tell the pages that we wrote after we had seen Airplane. Um, <laughs> it, it was. I wish I could find a copy of it, but I'm not sure I could read all the way through it. But you know, they understood that us doing that, because we were that big a dork even back then, um, made us that much more interested in the next Star Trek movie. They just forgive the first Star Trek movie and wait for Khan. 
you know, we were willing to do that. And they get that. Plus, they, Paramount never knew about our script because um, they probably would come after us because it was that bad. But most of them get that. Technically, it's an infringement. But, eh. Okay, there were questions in the back first. Um, we'll go up this side with the red shirt. Oh, wait, throw the thingy at him. They're allowed to throw that, aren't they? Yes. Yes, okay, pitch it. To him, not at him, is what I would tell the scouts. Um, okay. Shifting gears just a skip. Oh, sure. Um, I'm, I, uh, I'm a freelancer. I do okay. creative work. Look, photography, artists, writing. Uh, art, 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 art. Art, okay. Um, Sometimes uh, it matters. Most of, most of my work, well, all of my work is really meant for smaller players. Okay. So most of them don't actually understand um, copyright. Oh, most people don't. That's Yeah, and so... <laughs> You know, I, it's my understanding. That's why y'all are watching me rather than the parade. Come on, because you want to understand. It's it. my understanding that, that I don't need to disclose that as long as they're not asking for, uh, as, as long as they're not asking for rights, I'm retaining the rights on, on my creative work. Um, <clears throat> wow, see, there's a whole big it depends kind yeah, of thing. Yeah, yeah. If you're doing illustrations for their books, it may be considered a work made for hire and you may be losing your rights. Right. Oh, yay. Thank you, sweetie. Look, my phone. <laughs> and my husband. <laughs> so, so where are where I've been running into problems is now. Is this original artwork or is this like Perkins Spock knockoff? It's off original stuff? artwork. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, so I'm where I'm running into problems is when I talk when I try to have a conversation about it on the front end, uh, because I wound up I wound up in a really tight spot with somebody I was doing contract work for with a, mm -hmm. for a number of years, and then they started asking for things that I felt uncomfortable with. Mm -hmm. And I started trying to point them in the direction of, hey, you know, this is how it goes. And they, what they, I'm they did the contract immediately. So I'm like, okay, I want to talk about this on the front end. Yes. I'm happy to give you one year's exclusivity, whatever, on my work, you know, just, you know. But even then, people get weird and uncomfortable if they don't let, understand Let me give it. you so the advice you, that I tend to give people who are doing exactly what you're doing. The sooner you talk about it, and the less threateningly you talk about it, the better. So how if do you I do wait till, if, you, if well, if you wait until they want to do something that you don't want them to do, then you're already in conflict, and it's hard to have that conversation because you have to start using snarly words. And when you have to start snarling at the other side, they snarl back. Things get worse. Mm -hmm. If before anyone cares about it, before they have thought about what else they might want to do, say, well, as an as a professional artist. I have, you know, kind of a standard agreement here. It's no big deal, and I just want us to understand this going into it. How are you planning to use this? Now, I will let you do, you know, pretty much anything you want, but the more you want to use it, the longer you want to use it, the more ways you want to be able to use it in the future. Exactly. So let's define what your use is going to be. And then if you change your mind later, come back and ask, and it may be fine. We may need to come up with a new financial arrangement, but I do this for a living. I can't afford to give it away. So let's just talk about what you want to do so that I can price it appropriately. Sure. How do you want to use this? Now understand the underlying artwork is mine and I'm allowed to use it in a portfolio or something else. But if I'm making it for you, I voluntarily will tell you and I'll put it in this contract. So this is how you make it non-threatening. I'm giving you, because I'm a nice guy, I promise I won't sell this same drawing to someone else. Right. And I promise you won't see this in someone else's book. So I'll give you the only right to use this in a book. Oh, I promise, or, to, I promise to not even put it on my online portfolio or show it to anybody for a year. You know, I mean, yeah, well, sure. you can do that. Say, yeah. I won't even use it in my portfolio for a year. Yeah. And I promise you will not see this in anyone else's book, at least not for me. If they steal it, they steal it. But right. say, you know, I won't give this to anyone else. This is your yours to use. Right. But I'm keeping the copyright. Um, I'm keeping the copyright, but I want to make sure that you have all the rights you need, and I want you to understand how much I'm going to refrain from doing myself so that we're on the same page. And if you start with, I promise I won't do any of these things, even though you know I could, and I'll put that in writing, but we also need to put in that you can use it in your book, you can't sell it to anyone else, you can use it in your book, you can use it in multiple publications of your book, you can use it in a second edition of your book, you know, whatever you want to allow them to do. Say, but if you want to do something else, you need to tell me now, or you need to come back to me later before you do it so that we can you know, amend the contract and maybe talk payment then. 
And that puts them in mind that they're getting a package of rights and not all of your artwork. Yeah. But if you have that conversation just as part of the pricing conversation, then they're kind of there from the beginning and they don't later think, well, I bought this from you, I should get to do everything. It's like, well, we already had that conversation. And so if they do that, then they're jerks. They're just not surprised. People don't like to be surprised. Yeah. Surprise party is such a bad idea. People hate that. Um, it's fun for the rest of us, but it sucks for the person being surprised. Even good surprises aren't usually fun for people. So if you have that conversation before you've done the art and before they've known how much it's going to cost, they'll adjust their expectations accordingly. Or they'll still be complete jackasses about it, in which case maybe you don't want to work for them. Yeah, well that's what's happened with me the last few there are jerks out there who you just don't want to work with, but you can yeah. find that out before you waste your time and before they have your artwork. Yeah. That's the better time to find out. Okay, Thanks. next guy. We have a couple more minutes here. I just want to know if you could uh, talk about uh, the duration of a copyright, because I've heard about books that, you know, 50, 75 years become open source. Um, it's after, it's um, 70 years after the death of the author. Um, it, now, that's the short answer for current works for works published before 1976 and or five and or four, depending on when they were grandfathered in, it's different. The old act had two terms. If you didn't renew after the first term, it fell into public domain. If you did any of those things like publish it without notice, it fell into public domain. And it had a shorter term. Once we got towards the 70s, everything kind of got grandfathered in and extended. And the current rule is well after the death of the author. So the question doesn't have a short answer. It depends completely on when the book was published. Um, if it was published before 1922, you're set. That's your point. Okay, I think this guy's next. Toss that man a mic. Hello. Hello! Uh, you talked earlier about when you had an idea, you should go to the copyright office. And no, no, when you've written copy. it down. Well, I mean, like, when you, when, you, when you have the idea, like, written out or something like that. And I was wondering, like, say you're Tolkien, and he has a whole huge Wait, world. Wait, I have to be very boring. I'm sorry. <laughs> and he has a whole huge world to do, you know, all these different characters and all this stuff. When you go to copyright it, do you copyright the world? You say, oh, Middle Earth, and that's what you copyright. And then you copyright right? your first book. Okay. And the details of that book are part of your copyright. If you want to trademark your characters as um, a brand kind of thing, someone would probably be, if he were around now creating this stuff and no one else would beat him to it, he, people would be advising him, trademark that Hobbit, and those kinds of things. And I bet the movies have tried to do so, but anything that's already underlying in copyright, in details of lawyer stuff. Um, write the book, copyright that, the characters and the setting to the extent they're unique enough and detailed enough, and not just a fantasy village. You know, if I've got something better than a fantasy village if I want to keep other people from using the fantasy village. Well, they can use another fantasy village, they can't use my fantasy village if I've done enough that they can tell that it's my fantasy village. Does that make sense? Yeah. If my fantasy village is something more than kind of mud daubed houses with thatched roofs, a blacksmith and a pub, and a boarding house, you know, and some horses and some dogs running around, and paladins walking in, um, then if I've done something other than that so that you know it's my fantasy village, you can't use my fantasy village. Obviously, fantasy village is allowed. The blacksmith shop is allowed to be used. But you don't have to try to copyright, this is my world, this is, give them the book. And wait till you finish it. You don't have to send like every page and copyright it separately. Copyrights aren't that expensive. I, th I think it's still $35. It may, may have gone up recently. Um, but it's, unless you're trying to copyright every photo you've ever taken, then, it's, then put them together as a compilation, publish them, you know, copyright them as one chunk. But um, the, um, but for that answer, write your book. When you have the book, copyright that. If you haven't shown it to anyone yet, no one can steal it. Yeah. It's like how to keep a secret, don't tell anyone. So no one can steal it from you until you start putting it about. If you're gonna start publishing it about, I'd go ahead and file it with the copyright office. But I'm risk averse, because I'm not a litigator. And I am done. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm getting that, please be quiet, look. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, um, I'll actually be out back if y'all have a couple more questions. I'll take some then. But we are done. Thank you for joining us.